Um, uh, the uh, questions usually come in chat, um, and sometimes people even interrupt. Uh, so if you don't want any interruptions, we can request everybody. No, to... I'm actually fine. I'm hoping that there will be some interruptions. Uh, okay. Okay, good. Better to have an interactive. Uh, well, there is quite a. There are not so many people around. So if there are, uh, if some somebody wants to interrupt, they can interrupt. But I mean, it's up to you. Uh, people also <laughs> put it in chat, and we keep track of that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm perfectly fine with people actually interrupting. But uh, you know, sometimes the questions are asked in chat, and if I have uh, the full screen on, and then I might not see it. So that's why I was wondering if uh, some of you would keep track of the chat and. Uh, and stop me if if there is a question, but I am perfectly fine yeah, with we, actually. We that too, yeah. No worries. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, today we are very happy to have uh, Riti Putim as our speaker. Riti Putim is from ICTS TIFR Bangalore Center. He come. Did his uh, bachelor's and uh, master's from ISI Kolkata, and after that he did. Then uh, he joined. Uh, uh, then he spent uh, two years at. As Zeko assistant professor in Stanford, and then finally in ICTF. So it's it's, it's for. Uh, Yeah. So thanks very much for the invitation. It's a it's a great pleasure to speak uh, speak at the seminar, even though it's virtual. Uh, hopefully, I'll have an occasion to visit uh, sometime later um, in a more normal circumstances. But uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be speaking to this audience, nonetheless. So, uh, so maybe I I should just start sharing my screen again. So can you guys uh, share my, see my screen? Yeah, I can see. Okay, uh, so let me start. All right. So, so the uh, you know, the, the story I I plan to tell. So there will not be a lot of uh, mathematics in in today's talk. So what I'll try to Tell is a is a story that is being developed uh, in in mathematics and also also in physics over the past 30 35 years, um, and and it is uh, still an active active area of research. So the story is is still being being developed. So it's not a not a closed uh, book yet. So so the the primary object in the story is is a randomly growing interface. So these kinds of interface are are very commonly occurring in nature, right? So if you uh, take a patch of land and then drop, uh, you know, a huge number of grains of sand on it, then what do you expect? You know, after uh, you have dropped those sand grains, the height of these grains of sand at every point of the land will not be equal, right? So there will be some unevenness and there will be some randomness because uh, depending on how exactly you are dropping. And then there are other sort of uh, topographical factors and uh, lots of other things. So, so the point is that the surface that you will see is, is not, uh, it's going to be, uh, as you keep pouring more sand, this, the surface will grow, the height of the surface at different points will grow and it will grow in some sense randomly. So, so these are the kind of objects. So, so the kind of objects that we will focus on. So what I told you, uh, the example I gave you is of a two-dimensional surface, but uh, the um, what what we will uh, um, you know what we will talk about uh, in this talk is mostly a one-dimensional interface that is uh, growing randomly. So let's come to uh, an Sorry, example. I'm going to interrupt with me. Uh, are you moving your? Uh, I'm not seeing your slides change. Oh, I have not moved my slides yet. So this is all uh, all introduction. So I have not moved to the second slide yet. So I'm I'm moving into it now. So so let me give an example of a of a randomly growing interface, which is uh, more closely connected to the topic of this talk. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, 
among the audience, you know, for those of you who are undergraduates, uh, you have probably grown up in a uh, in a society where this kind of games were uh, very outdated. But I remember, so this is a game called Tetris, which came out in, in the 1980s. Um, so I remember when I was a kid, I had a handheld, uh, this video game console, and then uh, there was a variant of, of this game uh, in, in that console. So, so what, is, what is the point of this game? So as you can see, there are uh, these four si shapes of size four. There are seven different so there is a two by two square here. There is a four by one square here. So okay, there are seven different shapes. Are you changing the slide because I don't see any change? Uh, you are not seeing any change yet. So I have now changed to a second slide. You you don't no. see it? Uh, do no, we, we are still seeing the first one. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Now, okay. Yeah. Now yes. Yeah. Now it is. Um. Now it is visible. Yeah. You, you you can see it now, okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, all right. So, uh, what happened? But anyway, so you, you you are seeing it now, right? Yeah, it's yeah. So you see this uh, game of Tetris. Uh, so so there are these uh, uh, shapes of size four. There are seven shapes in all. So these are called tetrominoes. So this is a four by one, this is a two by two, these are this kind of uh, uh, weird shapes, and then there's the uh, you know, L-shaped uh, tetromino. So what does this game do in the, in the original version of the game? We will uh, consider a more uh, mathematically uh, easier to understand version a bit later, but what happens in this game? So at each time point, a new shape chosen by some algorithm randomly, drops from a random point from the top. And the classical version of the game, what you would be able to do is that you would be able to move it, you know, either to the left or to the right, and then reorient it, you know, rotate it by 90 degrees or, or 180 degrees or that kind of things, and then let it drop. So whenever it touches the current surface, the current interface, it stops. So this tetromino, for example, will fall all the way to the bottom here. But if it were coming one step to the left, then it will stop here. It will hit this orange piece here, and it will not be moving any further. All right. So, so now, uh, the objective of the game, of course, was to, uh, so whenever you completed a line, it will disappear. And then the objective of the game uh, was to never hit the top line. So whenever you hit the top line, whenever the, the surface will grow to hit the top line, you will, you know, the, the game will end. So that that was the, by, uh, the game. Just one that, minute. Yes. By by line means you mean left, right, crossing, something like that. No, so this top line, right? So the oh, this okay. this okay. shape is dropping from the top. And whenever this interface grows high enough to touch the top, that's when you die. Okay. And that's when the game ends. So this was uh, the, the original version of the game. Um, so, so of course, you know, I'm just not talking about any video game. It's a, it's a game of uh, considerable interest to, to mathematicians. And just to illustrate that, let me show you this uh, cover, uh, the notices of the AMS from, from 2016, where you can see that you know, they, they have produced a simulation of a version of this game. Um, and this particular version is, is particularly relevant for, for the talk here. Um, so let me now describe the, the variant of this game that has been um, depicted in the, in the AMS uh, notice. Uh, so, so as I said, at each point of time, you choose one of the seven randomly give it a random orientation, you know, so there can be uh, four different orientations, you give it a random orientation and choose a random location where you want to drop it. And now assume that the tetrominoes are dropping so fast so that as a player, you cannot do anything. I mean, you don't have time to move. Right? So, so essentially, there is no player intervention. You just 
let the surface grow as as it is uh, supposed to grow okay so uh, so what happens so what we are interested in uh, in looking at is is how the the top uh, of the envelope so this is a, this is the interface and it has a top envelope and the object of interest is that how does this top envelope grow in time so again uh, let me show you uh, how it grows in time so of course you know, i have copied all this from somewhere in the web so let me just take you to uh, the the original gif so maybe i can share uh, the the window so new share yes i have shared uh, now do you see the uh, the growing uh, gif file yes yes yeah this is this is what it exactly looks like so these tetrominoes are falling at random and then you know some some interface is, is being formed so as mathematicians uh what sort of uh questions are we uh, going to investigate for this this game so we look at some large time t so we're interested in the asymptotics uh, primarily so look at some large time t and consider this random interface that is given by this top envelope of this uh, this growing pile so the first question of course is something that we want to ask is that what is the average size of the average height of the pile at a given location right so that is the first question and then of course once we if we know about the average then the question we want to ask is what is the fluctuation of this interface riddhi i have a question it's yes. the height is changing with time so what do you mean yes. by average so i fix a time and i want to understand what is the average as a function of that time you know does it grow linearly in t does it grow like 2t 5t 7t square i want to understand that okay that's uh, you know as a, as a function of time that's that's what i mean uh, when i say what is the average height okay, and then then the next question of course i understand again in the same sense what is the order of the fluctuation around the average so does it grow uh, the fluctuation around the average is it a constant is it diverging as t goes to infinity is it growing linearly sublinearly what what is the order and then there is a another object that uh, people want to understand so this might not seem uh, most natural uh, for those of you who are who are not probabilist or um, you know are familiar with uh, statistical mechanics models so there is this object that is that is called uh, correlation length for for these types of uh, statistical physics model what does that mean so the correlation length is is a number such that if the distance of two locations is much much larger than the correlation length then the heights will be essentially independent and if it is much much smaller than the correlation length then the heights will be very highly correlated you know it's not clear a priori that such a length will exist but it is it is typical in many such model that there would indeed be a correlation length so there will be some function of t typically a power of t such that if the distance between two points is much much smaller than that then the uh, heights will be very highly correlated and if it is much much larger than that then the heights will be almost independent you know it's it's not that part is not very hard to see right so if you run this process for 10 time units and look at the height of two locations which are 100 units away then you expect them to be independent right because the the tetrominoes that contributes to the height of the pile at one location and the height of the pile at the other location they are uh they don't have any chance to interact at such a short period of time 
Uh, but uh, so you, is it not you're also assuming that the tetronymos are of infinite width, right? Yes. So that's uh, that's what uh, you know. The picture uh, I showed was of a finite width, but uh, typically, you know, to uh, for neater formulations, we will run the game on an infinite line, and we will rescale time so that on an average, one tetromino falls at one location per unit time. Okay, so that is uh, somehow a neater formulation. You can always uh, do similar things for these finite width models, but there are boundary effects that, that one needs to take care of and things are slightly less neat. So we will work with this infinite volume model. And, and is it not possible that, that this correlation length may also change with time? It is also a function of time. The correlation length typically is a function of time. Okay. So, you know, in most of the in models of interest, it will be a power of t. Okay. So, of course, you know, in some boring models like the one I will uh, tell you in the next slide, the correlation length might be constant. But uh, for most of the interesting models, the correlation length will be a function of t. Okay, so, so before uh, I, I tell you what sort of, okay, so first things first, uh, no one really knows you know, in a, in a mathematically rigorous way, what happens for the, the game of Tetris. Uh, but there are some predictions, of course, you know, you can run simulation and see uh, what is what is expected. So, so before I, uh, I tell you what are the expected answers in the, in the case of this, uh, this game of Tetris, let me just I talk about a much more boring version for which the answers are very easy. Okay, so instead of this complicated shapes of size four, what happened if we only had unit squares, right? So then the question becomes very easy, right? Because then the height at each location is just the number of squares that have dropped at that location by time t. So essentially, it's a and and you know if you uh, so it's a sum of approximately linearly you know sum of approximately some constant times t many iid random variables or not even iid random variables right so it's a so at each time you have a Bernoulli right either the height increases by zero that means nothing drops at that location at that time uh, or it increases by one. So the height at time n, say it's just a sum of n iid Bernoulli random variables. And we all know, you know, the height will then have a linear mean, uh, square root n fluctuation, and it will by central limit theorem converge to a Gaussian uh, and distribution. And again, in this case, it's very clear that uh, the the location of um, well you know if you uh, if you are looking at a finite width game and then there is a slight very slight dependence on um, you know how many uh, squares have dropped at different locations because the sum of them has to be equal to n because of the the discrete time version that that I described before but that uh, that dependence is very slight so essentially. Uh, the the height of of the pile at different locations would be almost independent. Now, instead of just having unit squares, even if we had two possible shapes, one unit square and a domino, which is a two by one square, and the domino could only be vertically oriented. What will happen then? It will be same, right? So instead of just having the height increase by zero or one, now the height can increase at each step by zero, one, or two. But the height at each location will still be a sum of IID random variables. Now, the central limit theorem tells you is that as long as I have finite mean invariance, sum of IID random variables, if I subtract off the mean and scale by square root n times the standard deviation, is close to a a standard Gaussian random variable. You know, if uh, you know if there are some undergraduates in the audience who have not uh, 
So anyone who has taken a probability class uh, is, is familiar with this uh, theorem. But if you are not, you know, you don't have to worry about what it means that it is close to a standard Gaussian random variable. Basically, means that the distribution looked like a, a bell-shaped curve, like the standard normal distribution. Okay, so so the point is that this boring version of the Tetris, it did not really matter what was the microscopic details of the model. If we added only the uh, unit square, or we added the unit square or the domino with a particular orientation, you know, I could add a unit square, a domino and a three by one square all with the same orientation and the answer so of course the speed of the growth will be different but the growth will always be linear in t the fluctuation will always be square root t and the scaling limit so if you subtract of the mean and divide by the the standard deviation the limit will be gaussian and the height at different locations will be independent so this is uh, what exactly this this line Okay. So, the, the important feature of this example that we that we want to keep in mind for the rest of this talk is that the the microscopic for the boring version of the Tetris, the microscopic description of how the dominoes were falling or how the unit square and or dominoes were were falling. It did not matter for the the critical scaling behavior of the model. The heights were always growing linearly in T. The fluctuations were of the order of T to the half. And the centered and scaled height converged to a Gaussian distribution. And different columns had almost independent heights. The correlation length was essentially one. So this is the feature uh, that this is referred to as universality. So as long as the uh, the model looks um, you know, broadly the same. The microscopic details of, of the uh, you know, exact implementation of the model uh, should not affect the, uh, the scaling behaviors asymptotically. So that, that is the feature that, that this is referred to as, as universality. So now coming back to, to the original uh, version of Tetris. Again, so this is where uh, you know, I'm, I'm now working on the, the uh, infinite line. So what is the predicted behavior? As I said, nothing is rigorously known, but there are predictions. So the predicted behavior is that these uh, models uh, belong to a different universality class. They will have very different behavior from the Gaussian universality class that uh, we saw in the case of the, the boring version of the game. So the first order growth of the height at a given location will still be linear in T, but the fluctuation around the, the average height, instead of being T to the half in the previous case, will now be T to the one third. And the scaling limits will no longer be Gaussian, it will be some non-Gaussian distribution. And the correlation length, which in the previous case was one because essentially all the uh, height that different locations were, were independent, the correlation lengths here would be of the order of t to the two third. Okay, so this is this is the predicted behavior for, for this particular game. And as I said, this we still do not know how to prove rigorously. But again, you know, this uh, is, yes. Uh, yeah, so here, uh, what you are considering that you have, uh, uh, I mean, finitely many, um, I mean, finitely many shapes of uh, tetrameron. Yes, instead of there are many shapes, okay. and at each location they are dropping at rate one independently. Right. 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 Okay. 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 So, so of course, you know, I mean, uh, uh, no one is really interested in this particular game of Tetris uh, unless you know it sort of relates to a more uh, uh, universally observed behavior. And this is what actually turns out to be that this particular behavior that I described as predicted for the game of Tetris is actually quite universal. And this is referred to as the, the KPZ universality. So what happens in the, uh, so there are 
sort of four general features. So this is, you know, this is not a math slide. I'm not saying anything math. So this is kind of general physics belief is that if you have a growth model, a stochastic growth model that sort of exhibits these four uh, behaviors, which is, you know, there is no long range interaction and the, the space time noise is independent. So these two behaviors were there for the boring version also. But three and four are the one which makes this is a different universality class. So one is that the growth, the speed of the growth is depending on the slope. So you have an interface, right, at any given time t. So if the model is such that if you have a high slope, then it will grow fast. And then if you have a, a lower slope, then it will grow much slowly which of course happens in the game of Tetris because you know if you had like a very uh, narrow cliff, it can be closed by just one tetromino falling on top of it, right? So the height can increase by a lot at a single go. So that is, uh, that is why the speed is depending on slope. And then there is this relaxation mechanism, which means that essentially valleys are filled faster than the peaks. Of course, you have, if you have a valley, uh, you know, it's, much more likely that you know they will be filled by either uh, tetraminos dropping in the valley or you know the valley the bottom of the valley is being closed by uh, you know outgrowths outcrops like closing the uh, the fissure so to say so this is predicted a long time ago that as long as you have these four sort of soft conditions being satisfied by your uh, uh, randomly growing interface, then you will see exactly the same predicted behavior. Again, it's, a, it's predicted to be universal behavior in the class, which shows these four, um, these four uh, features. You will see these. Ritri, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. What features of these uh, these four intuitively specify the exponents that you're talking about a third and a two third? Uh, so these two, three and four, will specify one third and two third. Okay. So I will, I will come to that in the in a couple of slides. So you know, so it depends on. So. Of course, you know you have to specify what exactly is the is the slope dependent speed. So it turns out that as soon as the slope depends non-linearly on the speed, which is the most you know, if you you see if you write down the equation that if it grows linearly, of course, then it would not it would mean that uh, if the slope is very negative and if it is very positive, then the behavior will be different, which is not really that goes with the behavior of, of Tetris. So you expect it to at least grow like a square. So, so as as soon as this uh, growth is like quadratic in the slope, then you will see that this uh, one third and two third crops up. I will I will I will not show you how exactly you can predict that, but I can I'll show you an equation from which, by doing some physics calculation, you can predict those things. Okay, so 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 this is named after three three physicists, Kardar, Parishi, and Zhang, who came up with this idea in 1986 where they said that as, as soon as we have these uh, sort of four unifying features, uh, lots of these models will satisfy this sort of universal behavior. So how did they come up with this one third and two third? This is exactly what, so this is their paper from Physics Review Letters in uh, 86, which is one of the most influential paper in uh, probability and statistics. I mean, this is, this is a physics paper, but it has been hugely influential in, in the probability literature as well as the, the statistical mechanics literature. So there they, they said that this equation approximately governs, so any such model which has uh, those four features, the behavior is approximately governed by these equations. So what does this equation say? It says that the rate of the height growing in time, it has a component which is, this is the relaxation mechanism. So the values are being filled quickly. And this is what I was saying that the, the rate of growth is non-linearly, it's quadratically depending on the slope. And then this is the stochastic component. So 
So this stochastic component, it is taken to be a space-time white noise. Okay, so you know, if you have uh, not seen this before, it's like you have at every point of space and time, you have an independent Gaussian. That's, uh, that's essentially what it is. So, so of course, you know, this is the partial differential equation with a stochastic component. So these are what are called the stochastic partial differential equations. And these are very hard to solve particularly because of this nonlinear term. Um, well, maybe I'll come to that, that later, but let me just uh, tell you what you can do. So if you, if you do, if you are a physicist, and if you do what is called a renormalization group analysis of this equation, you will see that this exponents one third and two third will crop up. So, you know, you will uh, say that if I rescale this noise, then the behavior should not be very different. And then, You'll assume some power law and then write down some linear equation and you'll solve and see that these one third and two third uh, crops up. So it's a, it's a not, you know, uh, as mathematicians, we probably are not very familiar uh, with those kinds of calculation, but as I understand, these are like bread and butter calculation for, for physicists. Um, okay, so but as mathematicians, you know, we, we are not uh, that happy with this sort of uh, renormalization group uh, kind of non-rigorous analysis. So there has been a lot of effort uh, in trying to understand rigorously the solution of the this uh, KPZ equation. But the problem is that this nonlinear term makes the uh, the equation in, ill posed, and it has been a huge challenge to uh, develop a theory for existence, uniqueness, and regularity for the solution of of this equation. And you know, uh, this was done in part by by Martin Harder, and uh, it was part of his uh, his work for which he was awarded the, the Pils medal in, in 2014. Um, okay, so, but, you know, KPZ equation will take us a bit far off field, but let me uh, tell you that, you know, I mean, these people came up with this model by, from some simplifying assumptions, but it turns out amazingly that there are many complicated examples in the real world, which does seem to, uh, exhibit the behavior predicted by, by the KPZ equation or the KPZ universality, I should say. So, so one of the first examples that was, uh, uh, was produced, it's a, it's a biological uh, experiment. So, you know, I'm not a biologist, so I can't really tell you what exactly they did, but they were growing some bacterial colonies in a Petri dish, and they were looking at the, the boundary of the colony. So the interface was the boundary of the colony. So the first picture is the size is the, is the colony, and the second picture is is like the the interface, which is the boundary of the colony. And it remarkably showed these predicted exponents. You know, since then there are other biologists who have done other experiments, and they have reported that you know their experiments don't quite match match these results. And there's so this particular case there is not uh, from the biology side. Uh, a consensus that this actually uh, the mutant bacterial colonies in general grow like the KPZ, like a KPZ interface, but there is some evidence that they do. And the second one, so this is like a, uh, you know, if you set fire to the edge of a, a burning paper and let it burn very slowly and, you know, so the, the edge becomes kind of jagged, right? So, so you have these ashes forming and then there are uh, jagged edges forming. So, so this uh, picture shows in time these, uh, these jagged shapes formed by the, uh, the edge of a slowly burning paper. And again, you know, people did measurements and things and, and it turned out, you know, as much as you believe simulations, it turned out that the results does tend to agree with again this one third and two third exponent for this, this interface uh, formed by the the burning paper. Uh, another example here it's uh, it's from um, liquid crystal. So this I really don't understand what is going on, but there was this uh, this paper in in scientific reports a few years ago where they so they took a liquid crystal and then they passed some electricity through it. And then the crystal sort of separated out into two different, again, what they say, I don't know, I don't have any idea what, it, uh, what actually it means, what they, are, they call dynamic scattering modes. So these two 
different colors you see in this picture. So these are called DSM-1, dynamic scattering mode 1 and dynamic scattering mode 2. And the interface is uh, between these two dynamic scattering modes. And again, they made measurements on, on this interface and it does seem to agree with the, the exponents and the, the scaling behavior is predicted by, by this KPZ equation. And then there was this another uh, very nice example. So, you know, all of these, there are many nice videos. And also you could, if you are interested, you could go online and search for like KPZ in real world. So there are many nice uh, illustrations where, you know, like snowflakes falling on a, on the windshield and that kind of thing. Many, many, many nice examples. But this is this is something I, I like. So, so this is like a, uh, the example of a drying coffee stain. So if you let a drop of coffee on a piece of paper, it forms a ring, right? So it sort of dries, it expands, and then it dries and shape forms something like a ring. Now, now these people uh, did an experiment where they slightly changed the composition. So instead of, so typically these experiments were done a long time back with spherical coffee beads, but they changed the shape of the coffee beads to be ellipsoidal. So there, they actually observed that instead of the spherical beads, if you do the same experiment of drying coffee stain with the ellipsoidal beads, then you do not really have a perfect ring anymore. You have some other deterministic shape, and the fluctuation around that deterministic shape is given by these this KPZ uh, exponents. So you know there are so these are you know real world examples. So there are no math these are no mathematical models, but somehow it appears that there are these many such uh, real world examples where you see this scaling behavior predicted by, by this universality class. So as mathematicians, what we would like to do is we would like to uh, sort of devise simple and analyzable models of random growth, stochastic models of random models of growth, uh, which will let us rigorously explain the uh, the emergence of, of these behavior, right? So this is this is what uh, the goal of the mathematicians have been over the past 20, 30 years. Um, so, so how much progress has been made? It really depends on the on the on your view. You know, if you want to view the glass as half full or half empty. So on one hand, uh, we so there are many mathematical models, you know, which satisfies these conditions, many very nice natural mathematical models and simulations suggest that all of them should belong to this, this KPZ universality class. But we have so far not managed to prove the universal behavior for any generic class of models. Well, so that is a failure. But on the other hand, there has been some success in understanding some very specific models which are called the exactly solvable models. So there are some mathematical models for the KPZ growth, which demonstrate some, um, you know, remarkable, almost magical connections to other branches of mathematics, and you can exploit those connections to um, to analyze those models, and in in a number of in a handful of of such cases one can theoretically, uh, rigorously uh, confirm these predictions made by physicists. So in the time that remains, I will uh, very briefly tell you about one such, uh, such mathematical model. So this is called corner growth model. So for convenience, instead of starting from a flat substrate, I'll start from a V-shaped initial condition, which is uh, called a wedge initial condition. So what happens is that, so whenever you have a corner, so like here you have a corner, the corner will flip after a random amount of time, after an exponential waiting time. So, so you have this, then this will flip, you have a valley and the valley will flip to a BFP after waiting an exponential uh, rate one amount of time. So after the first corner has flipped, this is the, the state of the, the interface. Now there are two corners. So either one can flip, you know, whichever clock, so there is a clock here and a clock here. So whichever clock rings earlier, 
will flip earlier so maybe this one now again there are two corners there are two clocks again so again you know whichever will ring whichever rings first you flip the valley to a peak maybe this one and you let it grow right so this is how the the interface evolves so what happens so at a large time t what what happens again is the height for this particular model at time t is the average height is at say location 0 this location the average height is is t over 4 the fluctuation is t to the 1/3 and the correlation length is t to the 2/3 so this is something we actually know how to show regressively for this particular model so so what exactly is known so you look at the height at location 0 at time t you subtract of the typical value which is t over 4 you scale by t to the 1/3 then it weakly converges to a distribution it's a universal distribution which is not gaussian but some other distribution uh, which is uh, familiar in random matrix theory so for those of you who are familiar with random matrices you will identify this as the gue tracy widom distribution uh, sorry was there a question Hello. Is there a question? Hello. No, no. It seems seems all right. Please go ahead. Ah, okay. Ah, uh, all right. So, and okay. So this is this is the the one point peak convergence. So the the height at a particular location, and then you know you can also ask. So if I scale the space. by the correlation length at which scale you are supposed to see a non trivial correlation so if you look at uh, the height at time t at spatial location x times t to the 2/3 and you subtract of the mean value and you scale by t to the 1/3 as well then you will see convergence to a stochastic process in x that has non trivial correlation so this is uh, now this is a this turns out to be a stationary stochastic process plus a parabola and the stationary stochastic process is called uh, the airy 2 process you know some some process where you can write down the the correlation functions explicitly but that's that's not of uh, of that much interest to us uh, so yeah. point is that one, one question yes. sorry yeah so i mean it looks uh, it appears to me surprising that correlation length is coming here i mean very vaguely is it because that you need a uh, you need a wedge or you need a corner uh, so that's uh, see, uh, see why the correlation length comes is that you are you know you are scaling by the fluctuation right so if you here if you scale by something much much smaller than t to the 2/3 then the two heights will actually be same after you have scaled so you will get something non degenerate Okay. so if you do not have this correlation length factor here if you have something smaller you will get something non degenerate here and if you have something larger you will get something widely fluctuating like the white noise okay. so okay. only per only scaling that lets you get something non trivial in the limit is that you scale the space by the correlation length because by definition if the correlation if your scaling is smaller than correlation length then the correlations are almost one right so you right. do not really see the difference right. and the the scaling is much larger than correlation length then things are very independent so you see right. something like uh, wildly fluctuating like a white noise okay, so that's why the correlation length uh, is is coming here thank you okay so so in this particular model you know much much more is known so i started for this uh, this wedge initial condition but you know you can start with almost any generic initial condition you can start with the flat line you can start with some other deterministic line you you still have something similar and then you can ask uh, if i look at the interface at some time t and some larger time t prime what happens what is the correlation between the two heights these kinds of questions are all all known and and much much more actually is known so so these are uh, the examples of a few examples so there are like a few others for which these kinds of things are known now i want to tell you briefly about what is the 
the speciality of this model, I mean, why we know about this specific model and not for the generic ones, is because this model and all other exactly solvable models, uh, they, they share connections with some other well-understood mathematical objects. So for, for this particular model, uh, for those of you who are familiar with young tableaus, you will uh, know of this uh, Robinson, uh, Robinson Shenstead Snooth RSK correspondence, where uh, you know a permutation can be can is there is a unique way to correspond a permutation with a pair of uh, semi-standard young tableaus. So using a variant of that that correspondence, one can actually explicitly write down the density for the time, the random variable, which is the time it takes for the height at a given location, say zero, to reach a given value. The formula is actually very complicated, but it turns out that it has a surprising connection. The formula that you get by using this RSK correspondence, that formula has a, has a surprising connection again to, to random matrix scale. And that lets us analyze this, this formula and uh, again, you know, it's a hard analysis. So, you know, I mean, there are these, uh, so you get a lot of these contour integrals and you do steepest descent and these kinds of things. Uh, and then there are also some freedom determinant uh, formulas that, that you can use the uh, Riemann-Hilbert type uh, approach to, um, to analyze. But essentially the results I, I told you about are obtained by analyzing these exact formula. Now, these sort of exact formula are very specific to either this corner growth model or there are like, you know, four or five others maybe models of, of this type of growth for, for which you have this surprising connection and you can write down an exact formula. And by analyzing those exact formula, you can verify the KPC prediction. But for a generic model of growth like the Tetris, Unfortunately, there appears to be no such exact formula, so we do not really know how to how to approach uh, those questions, uh, you know, at the precision required for verifying KPC predictions yet. So, so this is what I wanted to tell you about the last five minutes of talk. So, what are so this is you know the exactly solvable models is in some sense a success story, uh, but but what are the challenges you know this is a as i said this is a very active area of research so a lot of people are trying to do a lot of things so one of the most major challenges in this area is the, is a non integrable model so the models for which you do not have any such exact formula so let me give you an example so the tetris is kind of a contrived example it's it's a nice example to describe in talks but might not be the most natural to to attack mathematically so let me describe this very simple model which is called the Eden model, which was actually introduced in 1960, lots before, like 20, uh, 15 years before, uh, 25 years before KPZ. So this was uh, introduced as a model for bacterial growth on the plane. So at time zero, your bacteria colony is only the vertex, only the origin. And after each unit time, the colony will expand by adding a uniformly chosen neighbor. So you have, when you are at origin, so there are four neighbors, you pick one at random and you add that to the column. So now you will have, I don't know, uh, again, uh, six neighbors maybe. So then you pick one of the six uniforms uniformly and add that to the column. So at each time you grow by adding a uniformly chosen neighbor along the bond. Again, it is believed, you know, the, the growth mechanism broadly is not that different from, from the other models that we have seen. It is believed and uh, you know, simulations predict that it satisfies this uh, KPZ prediction. But unfortunately, there is no, no exact formula available to analyze this, this model. So here is a simulation. So you know, this, is, this is what it looks like uh, after a long time. So different colors show when a certain vertex was occupied. So as you can see, it seems like there is a deterministic shape, which is not quite a circle. And there is some fluctuation around, around that, that shape. So what is known rigorously? So we know the existence of this deterministic shape. 
So that is called that is one of the most celebrated results uh, in eighties probability. It is called the shape theorem. But for fluctuations around this deterministic limit shape, which is supposed to be of the order of t to the one third, only thing we know is, you know, the upper bound of t to the half up to a logarithmic correction, and the lower bound we know is something like square root of log. So we don't know anywhere close to the uh, the correct t to the one third. Uh, scaling prediction from KPZ and forget about the t to the two third, the correlation length. So, so in general, the status for understanding non-integrable models, which are still nonetheless predicted to be the K in the KPZ universality class, is exactly like this. So you know the first order linear behavior, but fluctuation, you know, you are very far away from what is predicted to be the the right uh, the you know the right order okay so that remains one of the the major challenges so just to summarize this is my last slide um so 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 what i want you to take away from this talk is that there is this rich class of universal behavior which is exhibited by empirically by many naturally occurring growing interfaces which is you know, not the the usual gaussian universal behavior and they, there is this uh, physics explanation for this universal behavior which goes by the name of Pardar Parishi's non universality which we mathematicians have managed to verify for a very narrow class of exactly solvable models but we are still very far from from understanding the general question of universality for uh, models that are not exactly solvable and as i said you know it's a, it's a very active uh, area of research with lots of interesting mathematics going on so i just uh, you know i just wanted to tell you tell you the story for for those of you who might not be familiar with this all right so yeah so this is uh, this is it and i'm happy to take uh, more questions yeah thanks for for your attention thank you very much really nice talk um, so any questions I have one question. Yes, please. Uh, suppose since you know taking Q from the integrable models that you had. Yes. Suppose you took an integrable model like, like an integrable Hamiltonian system. Yes. And just add a noise like you did white noise. Yes. But those models, do you can you show that it is the uh, there is correlation and so on? This random object like uh, no. torus. This, this is the problem. So if you you know, if you take an integrable model and you perturb it just slightly, it completely loses the integrability. So this, you know, these formulas are not robust at all. So these bijections that we are using, you know, this RSK or other kind of bijections that we are using, they are not at all robust. So if you if we make the model by perturb the model by very slight perturbation, the formula <laughs> completely collapses. You cannot. I mean, at least no one has been successful to like salvage. Uh, any vestige of the exact formula that was there after the model is perturbed. Uh, so suppose you had <clears throat> a small parameter and use CAM kind of theorems where you do uh, preserve. Will you get something like this or no? Not, not any, not that, uh, no, this has been tried, uh, but uh, people haven't managed to do that so far. You know, that's, that's how they did universality in the random matrix, right? So they right. first saw the Gaussian case exactly, and they said, "Now I perturb the Gaussian a little bit." And you know that's that's one of the first proofs of universality that came in the random matrix literature. But here, what happens is that if you have these exactly solvable models, they have some random matrix connection to the Gaussian matrices. But if right. you perturb a little bit, then there is no connection, or at least no one has been able to discover any connection to random matrix or any other. Sort of object which are well understood. So this is, you know, this is the most natural approach to to go for the universality. But uh, unfortunately, it hasn't. Uh, no one has been able to make it uh, make it work yet. Okay. Riti, one question yes. about the limiting shape of the Eden model. Yes. Uh, so uh, I mean, uh, 
something more is known. I mean, uh, so it is known that it, there is a limiting shape which is deterministic, but something more can be said, like uh, it is uh, boundary it is, smooth, something like that. It is convex. Um, so there is a is a recent paper by Yu Zhang, um, which claims that it is, uh, you know, it also can be shown that it is strongly convex. But okay. of course, you, you believe that it has a nice boundary with, you know, maybe smooth or analytic event. But those kinds of things are are not known. I mean, people will like to show uh, that very much, but that that is something that is uh, that is not known. And and the existence of the limiting shape is studied for higher dimensions also, right? Yes, yes. The existence of okay. you know, I have only described the planar thing, but the existence right. of limiting shape does not depend on the on the dimension. You can do this. So anything that is essentially not integrable, you can do it for for general dimension. You know, two is sometimes easier because uh, planarity gives you a lot of control. But uh, unless you are using some sort of integrability very strongly, typically the arguments go through for for higher dimension. So the limit shape existence is known for for any dimension. It's uh, nothing to do with the d equal to two. Okay, any further questions or comments? No, thanks for a very nice talk. I, yeah, I, thanks. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. I, I will yeah. stop the recording and then maybe we can all meet for a bit. Uh, actually, I have.